Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ulewan Intatha, or you can call me a Jan Po from School of Science. Now we are in Chapter 4, Material World. From previous lecture, we have learned about the basic concept of material, and also we have learned about the metal. So now we will study about the ceramic. I'm sure that everyone sees ceramic all around you, such as a cup of coffee, a tableware, the mirror, or the concrete that used to make the building. The chemical structure of ceramic is the important point that you need to know before you study ceramic. The ceramic material is the solid and there is the inorganic material that consists of the metallic combined with non-metallic together. The metallic, for example, silicon, iron or ferrite or aluminum. And for non-metallic, that can combine to be the ceramic such as oxygen, carbon, or nitrogen. The metallic and non-metallic, they bond together with the ionic or covalent bond. I give you some example about the clay mineral. Clay mineral is very important in material because that is the main starting material to make ceramics. K mineral can be divided into two distinct structure unit. The first one in the silicon tetrahedral. So you know that treta is mean four and hedral is mean face. The silicon tetrahedral, the structure will have the silicon in the center atom and surrounding with the oxygen atom. So if we count the number of phases that around silicon, you can count there are four phases. The first phases, second, the third in the bottom, and another one in behind this pyramid. So this one we call tetrahedral structure. And another example, aluminum octahedral. So octa is mean eight. It means that aluminum in the center atom surrounding with the oxygen, eight faces, such as in this picture. So the chemical composition can be varied from the simple compound of the mixture or there can be the compact phases bond together. In chemical, they have different com combinations. For example, if the tetrahedral combine with octahedral in the ratio of 1 to 1, we call kaolinite. But if the structure of tetrahedral combined to octahedral in 2 to 1, we call montolinite. So you can see that in the structure of material, there can be many forms depending on the structure of them and depending on the combination of the structure. So another good example, I will introduce you to know the silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide, they are solid. And the solid, as you know, the solid, they have the main type of structure. One is the crystalline. So the crystal is mean the structure of atom can be repeat in the same pattern. But another one we call amorphous. Amorphous is mean the structure 
that form the solid is the landom. So silicon in ceramic they have both crystalline and amorphous structure. If they are in the crystalline, you can see in form of the silicon dioxide. The silicon dioxide here, if they form to be the crystal, they can use in the application of the electroceramic, the ceramic that used in the electronic device. But if they form in the amorphous, they can be the grass. So you can see that different structure can lead to different application and different property and different uh, and different term to use. So if there are the silica that form to be the crystal, the melting point of them is very really high up to 1070 100 degrees Celsius. But if you adding the sodium atom of sodium into the silicon, the sodium is here can be bonding with the oxygen in the silicon dioxide. Bonding with the oxygen in the silicon dioxide that can be lower the melting point of silica to be 1000 degrees Celsius. So this one we call, we want to make the soda glass. And then we moving to the classification of ceramics. The ceramic can be divided into two main groups. The first group is the traditional ceramic and another one is advanced ceramic. For traditional ceramic, such as refractory, the earthenware, the whiteware, structured clay products, abrasive, brick and tie, and the last one, cement. This is the example for classical ceramics. And then another type of ceramic is advanced ceramic. This one we use in the high advantage for the high application at one application. For example, the at one ceramic that used in electronic material we call electroceramics. The electro word electro is from electric electrical. So it means electroceramic is mean the ceramic that used in electrical application. So if you seeing your mobile phone or your smartphone, inside your smartphone they have the circuit. All part of the circuit make from the ceramic. For example, the IC, the capacitor, the piezoelectric, the magnetic ceramic, the conductive ceramic, and also the optical ceramic. The screen of some, uh, the screen of some smartphone also made from the ceramics. Sometimes the advanced ceramic can use in the other application, such as in nuclear ceramics, in the automotive application, in the wear resistant ceramics, also in the bio ceramic. The bioceramic is mean the ceramic that have the application contact to the bioorganism and they have the advantage in the medical application. So these ceramic are compatibility to the human body or cannot give the toxic to our body. For example, we use the ceramic to make at the artificial teeth. We use the ceramic as the uh, 
the bone, artificial bone, to help the patient to repair some part of the patient. Then, above we talking about the classification of ceramic, and now we move on the classification of glass. The glass can be divided into different category depend on the factor that we consider. And now I will introduce you to know about the uh, classification of glass by using the composition. So, glass can be divided into two categories. The first one is oxide glass. And another one is non-oxide glass. So, for oxide glass, if we use the component to be the selector, we can have a lot of types of oxide glass in this group. For example, if you have only one component we call single component glass for example silicon dioxide germanium dioxide if your glass have two composition we call binary system for example silicon dioxide combined with sodium oxide lead oxide combined with germanium dioxide something like that if your glass have three combination we call trinary system if your glass have glass have four component we call quarter quaternary glass system and if you have more than five composition we call multi component glass system same as the example the oxide glass are depending on the composition and they can be sometimes they can be classified by depending on the application also the first example for oxide glass we call soda lamp glass soda lamp glass is the less expensive commercial glass for soda lamp glass, we normally use for the window glass or because they have the good light transmission. And sometimes we use the solar lamp glass in the glass container or jar. The soda lamp glass will consist of the silica is the main composition. Silica 62 75% soda or sodium carbonate 12 to 18% and the last one is lime calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate 5 to 12% and also we can be add some material in order to improve the other properties then for conclusion, the solar dam gas consists of mainly silicon dioxide or silica and then soda and then lime. Silica 60 to 75%, soda 12 to 18%, and lime or carbon carbonate about 5 to 12 percent and the main advantage of this glass because they are not resistant to high temperature then we normally use at the miller for construction or the container for the juice for the drink This glass that not have not resistant to high temperature and suddenly thermal chain. So it means that if they are contact with the uh, thermal shock, they can be cracked easily. This is the concept of soda lamp glass. 
and then we will move to the borosilicate gas. The borosilicate gas is widely used in the manufacturing of laboratory glassware, the pharma pharmaceutical container, the high the high power electric pump, because they have good heat resistance property and thermal shock resistance. So we normally see it in the microwave container or to make the beaker in chemical lab to make a test tube in science laboratory, something like that. The main ingredient for borosilicate gas are silica and boric acid. That's why we call borosilicate gas. The oxide of sodium, potassium, and aluminum can be added to borosilicate gas to adjust and make the good chemical durability for this one. The third type of oxide gas, I will introduce you to know the lead gas. The lead gas are widely used for the decorative purpose because they have high reflective index. Lead gas that contain silica, 64, sorry, 40, 54 to 65%. Lead oxide, 18 to 38% and sodium oxide, 13 to 15% and the other oxide for the small proportion. If you adding lead into the composition less than 18, we call crystal glass. Crystal glass we normally use in the tableware to make the um, white glass, something like that. Or they make for the chandelier, for the decoration house. But if you increase the lead content higher to 65%, this type of glass can you use for the radiation chill glass as the lead absorb. So this is the concept of lead glass. And the next type of glass we call glass ceramics. This one we combine glass and ceramics together. If you still remember the glass, it means they have the structure of amorphous. And the ceramic, the structure will be in the crystal or crystalline. So we control the crystallization glass leading to the crystal glass, it means that during the structure, they have some small crystal inside the glass. This, this is the glass. And we control that they have the some ceramic crystal inside the structure. So the Glass ceramic. There are consists of many components. For example, uh, lithium oxide combined with zinc oxide, lead oxide, and silicon dioxide, something like that. And also, lithium dioxide, aluminum dioxide, silicon dioxide with potassium oxide as the nucleation agent. The nucleation agent is mean like the seed that we would like to put it into the glass to make them growing to be the crystal. The glass ceramic have the very special or uh, improved property such as the extremely resistant to thermal shock, high mechanical strain or uh, chemical stability. The gas ceramic can found in the application in field of the missile technology, astronaut, 
astronomical telescope and the cooking ware and also in the screen of your mobile phone. So we're moving to the non-oxide glass. This one is very special. Non-oxide glass that will be prepared for the many com composition. Some important non-oxide glass are charcoalogenized glass and also fluorocirconate and fluoroaluminate group that will generally using for the fiberglass for the communication, telecommunication application. And also, non-oxide guard uh, can be used in the electrical or optical memory. So we move moving to how to make ceramics. If you imagine that you want to make the ceramic, you can do it by you being the care to be the starting material, and then you forming them by sculpture or by put into the mold or make it into the slip. That means forming, and after that they form into the shape that you want. You put it into the oven to fry it, and then you will get ceramic. This is a concept of ceramic. So I will conclude you into the scientific term here. The manufacturing of ceramic, there will be the three basic steps. The first one, material preparation. For example, you bring the clay, and then you mix some uh, chemical composition into the clay or you mix some water into the clay. This one will be the step of material preparation. The second one, after you get the suitable starting material, you will be forming them or casting them. After they form into the suitable or required shape, then you will Moving to the next step will be the thermal treatment by drying or frying into the oven. This one requires a very high temperature. Then I will show you the step to make the jar here. The first step that I'm making the celery, make the clay powder to the dispersing agent. Dispersing agent here, we put into the clay powder in order to uh, disperse our starting material to be the non-accumulate. After that, we put it into the powder. Mix it together, then you get the serrari or the slip. After you get the serrari, you pouring the serrari into the pasta mold. You pouring the serrari into the pasta mold. So you leave the serrari into the mold for some time or the cup of minute. If you want to make the jar, the wall of the jar to be thick, you can be increase the time. If you want the clay, the jar, the, the wall of the jar to be thin, you just leave it a few minutes. So you pouring the celery into the mold. Then the mold is the pasta. The pasta will absorb the water from celery into the mold. They absorb the water from celery into the mold. Then you can get the shape of celery connect to the wall of the mold. After you get the suitable thickness, then you draining the celery out 
and the survey here can be reversed to use in this step again. After you draining the salary out, you have partial drying them first, and then wrapping and separating the mold. The last step, you fine to make it dent and to be the salary. This is a step that we call slip casting method. And then we move to the how we make the glass or the manufacturing of glass. We starting from raw material, also the same concept. We starting from the raw material. We make the sand. The sand is silicon dioxide with the soda, sodium oxide with lime, with the cutlet. This one you can get from the recycled glass and some of other to improve the property of the glass that you want. After you, you mix it together, you melt the raw material with high temperature. And the next step will be container forming. After you forming them, the glass have to be heat treatment to improve their property. Then we move on to the inspection step to seeing what's wrong with our glass container and then pack and then sew it into the market. Then I will show you the briefly of how they make the manufacturing glass. Let's see the video. Whether they're colored or clear, glass bottles and jars are green. No trees die to make this eco-friendly packaging. Glass is made of natural ingredients that are abundant. You can recycle glass endlessly, and making it uses less energy than producing metal or plastic. for glass combines about half a dozen natural raw materials, but the main ones are silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. Silica sand usually makes up about 45% of the batch. The soda ash helps melt the silica evenly. It comprises about 15%. A limestone content of about 10% makes the finished glass more durable. They combine these ingredients with recycled glass called cullet. The factory's equipment feeds precise amounts of the materials into a furnace. Over a full day, the fiery heat, 1500 degrees Celsius, melts everything together, producing a gooey liquid that's the consistency of honey. The molten glass pours out of the furnace. Shears cut the flow at precise intervals to produce cylindrical gobs. Each gob is the exact amount required to make one bottle or jar. They drop to a device called the scoop. The scoop moves them to troughs that feed them to jar and bottle forming machines. A gob of molten glass goes into a preliminary mold. In a matter of seconds, it comes out as what's called a parison, a miniature version of the final bottle. Each parison then moves into a blow mold, the cavity of which is the shape of the final bottle. The equipment blows compressed air into the parison, stretching the glass outward towards the wall of the mold cavity. This process creates the final bottle shape and hollows out the inside. These are amber-colored beer bottles. The color is produced by adding small amounts of iron, sulfur, and carbon to the glass mix. The factory uses a similar manufacturing process to produce other types of bottles and jars. 
In this run, the company is making 375 milliliter wine bottles out of clear glass. This run is producing 375 milliliter liquor bottles, also out of clear glass. But this mold has a special feature, a recessed insignia on one of the walls, which produces a raised insignia on the front of the bottle. After the bottles leave the forming machine, they travel through flames. Otherwise, they would cool down too quickly and crack from thermal shock. A loader now gently pushes the bottles into what's called an annealing layer. The bottles cool at a controlled rate as they move through the layer. This releases stress from the glass gradually. As the bottles exit the annealing layer, a sprayer coats their exteriors with lubricant. This enables them to move smoothly through the rest of the inspection and packaging line. The bottles now line up in single file to head into the automatic inspection station. As the machine spins each bottle, cameras and probes check for imperfections such as cracks or bubbles. Inspection equipment then examines the top to check dimensions and ensure the threads for the screw cap are molded correctly. Before shipping, a worker does a final visual inspection. The proportion of cullet in glass can be as high as 90%. Cullet melts at a lower temperature, so for every 10% of cullet in the mix, the factory uses up to 2.5% less energy to produce its glass. Now that's an incentive to recycle. After you're seeing the clip of how to make the ceramic and glass, now we will move to the ceramic and glass property. So we first start with the mechanical property. The typical ceramic and glass are stiff, strong, and hard, but however, they can be easily to brittle or fungi. So, for example, if you dropping the cup of coffee to the floor, you can see that they can easily to break, something like that. Let's take a look at this introduction to the Glass Aid and the Innovation. This video will be produced by the glass manufacturer Corning Incorporated. We will be giving you the idea of the mechanical property of glass. That will be very exciting and very motivate you to study about the material. Let's see the video. Pop quiz. If you were able to look back on the present from deep in the future, what age would you say we're living in? Is this a trick question? I mean, I want to say information age, but it seems too obvious. Can I say more than one age? Yeah, I think it is safe to say that we are living in more than one age. From the beginning of humanity, we've seen prevailing technologies marked with milestones. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, all occurring many thousands of years ago. Man's mastery of these materials has defined us, but by that metric, the last couple of hundred years have seen a flurry of ages. The steam age, the industrial age, the atomic age, the television age, the space age, to name but a few. But those are not the answers I was looking for. Is that a clue? Yes, it is. I think that this age could be classified as the glass age. That's not what I was thinking. I know. So how are we in the glass age? Well, let me put it to you this way. Can you imagine a world without glass? Now, I don't want a cheeky answer. I want you to really think about it. Okay, no. 
I can't imagine the world without glass. Exactly. Glass is really quite extraordinary. Without it, many of our major accomplishments would never have happened. Glass has a deep and complex history, and as a material, it has properties and characteristics that we are only just beginning to understand. We look right through it and think of it one-dimensionally. Most of us think of glass as a fragile, brittle thing that, if not handled correctly, will break in a spectacular fashion. So you're gonna break that to make a point? Indeed. Can I help? Yes, you can. And it's true, our everyday common variety of glass is brittle, but it doesn't have to be that way. Glass has already altered our lives and is behaving in ways that is totally unexpected. Got it. Let's start with a history of glass. I think I can handle that. Glass as we know it is most commonly made of silica, the primary ingredient of beach sand. Mix silica with a couple of other key ingredients, heat it all up till it melts, and bang, you got glass. Humans have been making glass since ancient times, starting with beads, vessels, and ceremonial accoutrements. Glass making techniques spread out from Mesopotamia, culture to culture, changing in incremental ways for much of the last 4,500 years or so. The Romans even had glass windows on their important buildings as early as the first century AD. Glass blowing was discovered around that time and soon inexpensive and ubiquitous glass became one of the hallmarks of the Roman Empire. But no period has seen such growth in the development of glass technologies as in the last 150 years. We've been able to unlock the secrets of glass in ways that would have seemed like magic to our forebears. Nice. Thanks. So tell me what's so special about the last 150 years. Well, several things. In that period, technology evolved at an exponential rate. With that came tools and processes that enabled advancement across all material sciences. The leader in glass material science was, and still is, an upstate New York glass company that started out in the mid-1800s, Corning Incorporated. One of their first products was a toughened glass lens for railroad signal lanterns that offered two radical improvements over any other lens of that time. It could be produced in a consistent color and, more importantly, it didn't break when rain hit the hot glass. This helped save lives by bringing down the number of train wrecks, but it also set a course for 160 years of innovation in glass. Of course, everybody knows about Corningware and Pyrex products, too. Those innovations came from Corning during the early part of the last century. You know, I have tons of this in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. But Corning no longer makes kitchenware. They've innovated way beyond that. Let's take a look. We'll start with this. Ah, optical fiber. Right, optical fiber. This does two things, both astonishing. The first one is this. That right there is pure glass. A glass strand inside the cable, tightly wound around a pencil and yet not breaking. When you stop and think about it, that is a mind bender. Okay, what's the second thing? Well, it's the way the light moves through the glass. When the glass is bent this way, you'd expect light to leak out and get weaker and corrupt the data that it carries. But that's not happening. Nearly all the light entering this optical fiber is coming out the other end. So it has a low attenuation? Yeah, exactly. Very low. In the late 1960s, Corning figured out how to limit the attenuation or loss of light as it travels through fiber, even when that fiber is bent. Nice. This discovery led to the practical use of fiber as a medium for voice and data communications over great distances, ushering in an era of low-cost, high-bandwidth communications and ultimately the internet as we know it. Wow, so just how much data can these optical fibers carry? This video playing back right here is sucking in data at around 20 gigabits per second. That is a lot of data. Yeah, this is ultra high definition raw video, but even in this case, the optical fiber is not anywhere near capacity. The bottlenecks are here and here, not here. The practical limit of data transport over optical fiber keeps increasing. Using today's technology, it's possible to transport more than a million gigabits per second, about a petabit. That'd be like downloading 17,000 high-definition movies from Netflix in a single second. That's amazing. Okay, tell me about this stuff. Well, obviously it's an optical fiber as well, but instead of sending light through one end and out the other, it emits light throughout its entire length. Cool. What's it good for? 
I have no idea. Okay, so I was able to seriously bend a strand of glass. Didn't break. But what do you think's gonna happen when I try to bend a pane of glass? Uh... Rhetorical question. Check this out. That doesn't look like it went very well. Well, that was soda lime glass, the kind of normal stuff we see around us every day. But watch what happens next. This, this is glass too. It's called willow glass, also made by Corning. And it's flexible. No way! I cannot believe that is glass. Well, it is. There's no trickery here. This is glass, but it's as flexible as paper. So what kind of applications does that have? Well, that's where it gets really cool. Check this out. All right, it's, uh, it looks like a piece of stainless steel. And what is this, willow glass bonded to one side as a scratch-resistant coating? Yep. Okay, but tell me this, how is the willow glass anywhere near as durable as stainless? Well, that's a good question. Watch this. Amazing! I cannot believe that the blade did not shatter the glass. It didn't. And that's just half the story. All right, so what are we doing? Give me that. Okay. Take this. This is heavy, man. What do you want me to do with it? I want you to drop that right on that piece of stainless steel with a willow glass on it. Seriously? Let's see what happens. Here we go. Three, two, one. No way! It dented it, but it didn't break the glass. That is insane! And you can attach this to just about any solid surface. <laughs> Bendy, flexible, durable glass. Impressive. And characteristics you wouldn't normally associate with glass, right? Right. I like this new glass age we're in. Let's switch gears. Your smartphone. You hold it in your hand, you put it to your ear, you keep it in your pocket or your purse. It's a great everyday use of glass that you might not think about. Until it breaks. Until it breaks. I myself have shattered over a dozen of these. But you might have noticed over the years that the display on your phone has been getting harder to break. Let's go back a few years. <laughs> If you'd done that to your standard 2008 phone, that's what would have happened. Not pretty. No, and that could easily happen just by keeping your keys and your phone in the same pocket. And if you then dropped that phone, well, the probability of the phone breaking was high. How high? Very high. Let me show you. Aren't you going to drop the phone? Well, sort of. Instead of dropping the phone, I'm going to drop something on the phone, uh, this steel ball. For consistency's sake. Exactly. In this way, my phone drops exactly the same way every single time. Here we go. Three, two, one. Oh. I've seen you do that so many times in real life. <sighs> Me too. But that was then. This is now, thanks to Corning, we have Gorilla Glass. I'm pretty sure that's what I've got on my phone. And it's on this phone as well. I'm about to do the same test a second time. Check this out. No scratch. Not at all. Now, same drop test. Ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Wow. What a difference a few years can make. Actually, Corning came up with this method for strengthening glass long ago. Gorilla Glass evolved from that process and today is found on all the best small devices like this. It's beginning to find its way onto larger format displays too. Now, 
It's not unbreakable. If you set out to break it, you will. But as Corning figures out ways to unlock more secrets of glass, it will continue to get more resilient. It may even get to a state where devices such as these simply don't break anymore. Oh, and by the way, Corning has just come out with a new and improved version of Gorilla Glass. Really? Yeah. Let's go deeper. Watch this. Hot stuff. Yeah. This hot stuff is your basic everyday soda lime glass. There's nothing remarkable about it except that it's white hot and molten. There we go, and I'm going to drop it in cold water. It's called a Prince Rupert drop. Who's Prince Rupert? Some Bavarian from the 1600s. He came up with this. Okay, so there's a few things going on here. The cold water rapidly cools the exterior surface of the glass, hardening it almost immediately. The interior, still molten, cools more slowly. As it cools, it contracts and attempts to pull the surface in with it, but it can't. Well, not very much. The surface is already hardened, so it gets pulled in only a little, compressing it while also creating an internal layer that remains forever under tension. It is this action that gives the glass its uncharacteristic strength. We call it compressive strength. Hmm. It sounds like the same principle as how an arch provides strength in structural engineering. Yes, kind of. Now, Jamie, I'm gonna ask for your help. We're going to attempt to destroy this Prince Rupert drop. I just want you to tip that hammer past its center point. Go ahead. I feel like we've been swindled. Swindled not. We have just experienced the power of compressive strength. It does, however, have an Achilles heel. Take those nippers right there and nip the backside of the tail of this Prince Rupert drop and watch what happens. Wait, wait, wait. Cue the high-speed camera. Okay, here we go. was even cooler than I thought it would be. That is what happens when you release the stress in compressive strength glass, the whole thing shatters. Spectacularly. Yes, well, at least in that example it was. That's because the stress was so great between the outer compressive layer and the inner tension layer. That when released, it was a catastrophic result. This is Gorilla Glass. It has been refined over time, but like all Gorilla Glass variants that came before it, it is compressive strength glass. But it's not made in the same way as we just demonstrated, the rapid cooling method. No, instead, Corning uses an ion exchange process. To break it down simply, the surface ion particles that naturally form during the manufacture are replaced with larger ion particles. Once exchanged, the larger ion particles create the same sort of inward pressure that we see on the Prince Rupert drop. And with this method, they are able to control and manage the resulting tension. I think what you're saying with this process is that they're able to tune strength in the glass by dialing in the right balance between compression and tension? Yeah, that's a great way of saying it. That, and also by adding in a few other tricks that change the molecular structure of the glass. Corning is steadily moving forward towards the holy grail. Thin, unbreakable glass for our mobile devices? Well, maybe not unbreakable, but yes, thin and very tough. And by the way, the applications for this tough glass go well beyond mobile devices. Let's go over this way. Behold, the common automobile windshield made from regular soda lime glass. It's quite strong because it's very thick and it's laminated, which means it's two pieces of glass bonded together using resin in the middle. And the resin does two things. It gives it added strength and it holds the glass together on impact. You've probably seen broken windshields before. Lots of crazy cracked glass, but still mostly held together in the shape of a windshield. Like this. That's pretty cool. Yes, it is. Windshields have been made of laminated glass for the last hundred years and they've served us well, but there is a big drawback. I think I know what you're gonna say. It's heavy. Yes very heavy. And as we strive for more energy efficient cars and trucks, the weight of all that glass can be a bit of a problem. I have a feeling you're about to show an alternative. Yes. Take a look at this. Now this is also a laminate windshield, but it's not one you'd find in production. It's experimental. 
which is great because we're going to experiment with it. It has regular soda lime glass on its outside surface and resin in the center like the other one, but this windshield has Gorilla Glass on the inside surface. Sweet. It looks thinner. Yes, it is. And a lot lighter, too. In fact, just by changing the one laminate, the overall weight is reduced by about a third. In a car, that adds up fast. Thinner, lighter, and let me guess, it's just as strong as windshield A. Well, maybe. Let's find out. Oh, goody. Okay, wait, 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 no, 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 no. you don't need the sledgehammer for this one. Put that down. Instead, you're gonna shoot this windshield with an air cannon. Cool. No, don't get too excited. We're gonna have to mount this, tie it down so it doesn't wobble, and we're gonna simulate a pebble hitting this windshield at a super high speed. Good enough for me. When do I start shooting? Well, before we shoot the Gorilla Glass laminate, let's shoot the regular soda lime laminate, windshield A. This way. All right, here we go. Perfect. You wanna do the honors? Sure. I'll count it in. Three, two, one, go! Whoa. <laughs> that was a lot of damage. Can we see that in slow motion? The ball bearing hits the windshield at around 120 miles per hour. This could be a stone flicked up by another car. It penetrates the exterior glass, it stretches the resin, it's slowed down a bit, but it still has momentum to break the interior glass layer, causing small fragments of glass to spray out through the interior of the car. Not good. So let's try windshield B. The Gorilla Glass didn't appear to break. The foil is intact. Let's see it in slow-mo. The ball bearing hits the windshield at around 120 miles per hour just as before. It goes through the front layer of soda lime glass, stretches the resin, but doesn't have enough energy to break the Gorilla Glass. It's not bulletproof. I'm pretty sure if we turned up the velocity, we'd breach the Gorilla Layer 2. But in this test, and all things being equal, it performed a lot better than the thicker, heavier soda lime laminate windshield. That's impressive. What we're seeing here is compressive strength at its finest moment. Okay, so it's lighter, thinner, and stronger. That's pretty good. Yes, it is. Can I get this on my car? Not today, but soon, I hope. Come on, though. After living through the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, you could wait a little longer. Actually, when you think about it, the application for this goes way beyond the car, doesn't it? Ah, yes. Feels good to be in the glass age. Come on. Don't touch me. Sorry. Then, after we study about the mechanical property of glass and ceramic, we move to the thermal properties. As the amorphous material, glass does not show the real melting point temperature depend on the composition of them. But it regains the softening and achieves the liquid light state. When you're giving the high temperature enough, that will light the lava from volcano. The main Thermal characteristic of glass container is ability to ensure the thermal shocks. After that, we are moving to the electromagnetic properties. So, due to the amorphous structure of glass, the chemical structure of glass, if you use the pure silica, they have the you will cut off around 150 nanometers, and the color of this glass will be in the clear color or colorless color. So, if you adding some alkali oxide into the glass composition, they can make the UV barrier effective, the high wavelength. So it means that if you adding some alkali oxide into the mixture of glass or composition of glass, they can, can give you the different color. For example, you adding iron oxide into the glass, into the silica, you can get the green color bottle. 
if you add in copper you will get the blue color if you add in gold very surprised they can get the ruby or red color if you are getting manganese there will be purple color if you adding cadmium into glass they can get the yellow color something like that so it means that the color of glass depends on the alkali oxide that we putting in the glass composition so glass is also perfectly transparent to microwave leading to the low energy dispersion so that's why we will use glass to be the container for microwave and the last property of glass is we call chemical inert inertless so most of generally advantage of ceramic and glass container is the inertless to food and beverage contact so we can put orange juice that will be the acid into the ceramic and glass bottom that one will be safety or oh, no chemical reaction or reverence slashing phenomena when contact to the food or beverage that why the main application for ceramic and glass will be the glass will be the food container because there are food safety so from now on i think you can get the idea some idea about the ceramic and glass material and I'm sure that there will be the very good advantage for you to select the suitable material in your application. Thank you.